the announcement day. Hello everyone and welcome to my space vlog! I'm so excited because I have a big announcement to make. After completing years of training, the day I've been waiting for all my life is finally here! I was always happy to be among the 350 people who have been selected to be NASA astronauts, you know. And here's a fun fact for you. The original seven is included in that number. So it's fair to say I'm in the Legends League. But the great news is that now I'm finally done with the virtual reality lab and I'm actually going to go into space. There are so many things I need to do to get ready for my first mission. So I'll keep today's vlog short, but get ready to hear all about my space adventures in the upcoming days. The day before the launch. Now you would think the day before the launch would be a busy one for the crew, right? But it's actually quite relaxed in terms of things to do. Since the upcoming days are going to be stressful, NASA lets us spend time with some of our selected family members or friends who have been cleared to be near us during our pre-flight quarantine. We also get to stay at a beach house they own. Is this a dream job or what? But the most important thing we're advised to do today is to get a good night's sleep. That is, if you can, but no pressure. I'm going to try and do that now, so off to bed I go. It's a good thing that we were banned from drinking coffee 24 hours prior to the launch. Otherwise, I bet all the caffeine would prevent me from having peaceful dreams. Launch day. Today is the big day. First of all, although it's one of my favorite songs, I'm trying to avoid listening to David Bowie's Space Oddity. Because ain't nobody wants any sad vibes. <laughs> Secondly, coffee is not permitted for breakfast on the morning of the launch because of its diuretic properties. Having to use the restroom all the time can be a bit of a problem when you're going off to space in the cockpit, you know. Now, this may be a bit shocking for you. But other than all this, the astronauts have a significant chunk of downtime during a launch day. Before we depart for the launch pad, we do a final check and head to the restrooms for a pre-launch pee. Then it's time to climb into the cockpit. Many of us actually take a nap once we're there, as the system goes through thousands of pre-launch checks, including air-to-ground voice checks with launch control and mission control. And here's a fun fact for you. We wear adult diapers during this time, just in case. All right now, let's eliminate talking about elimination for now. Well, now that everything is checked, it's time to start the main engine. Prepare for liftoff! 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Woohoo! A day in space. Welcome to space. Now, I was going to say I will walk you through what a day for an astronaut on a space mission looks like now. But up here, I will float you through it. <laughs> now, first of all, every minute and every second of an astronaut's day in space is planned. From eating and brushing our teeth to working and sleeping, every move we make is based on a schedule. The things we have to do are planned down to 5-minute increments by a team in mission control called Ops Planner. This is crucial because these schedules show what is happening and who is involved with what at any given time on the space station. But don't worry, it's not all work and no play. Even if those are according to a schedule, too, we still have free time to ourselves. Now, the concept of a day aboard an orbiting spacecraft is a bit different than what you might imagine. Every 24 hours, astronauts on board the International Space Station experience 15 sunrises and 15 sunsets as the station moves around the world. But for millions of years, humans have been living according to a 24-hour daily cycle. Our brains and bodies follow the circadian rhythm of waking and sleeping. That's why astronauts work and sleep to similar schedules that match these cycles and rhythms, because anything other than that would have us living in a state of permanent jet lag. Accordingly, an overall day for us looks like this. The workday is from approximately 6 a.m. to 9.30 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time, and it includes three meals and two and a half hours of exercise. The Morning Routine Our space morning schedule is sort of similar to our Earth morning schedule. We are awoken by an alarm, and we begin our hygiene routine with the stuff that is provided for us in our hygiene kits given by NASA. Those include rinseless shampoos that require very little water, since there are no genuine showers in space. The funny thing is, the water we use floats away during this. 
And each of us is allowed to take our choice of products with us in these kits, including cosmetics and toothpaste. There are razors to shave or clippers and scissors to give ourselves and each other haircuts if necessary. We just have to make sure to vacuum up that hair so it doesn't fly in our faces later as we're working. The food. Ah, we don't skip breakfast. Mm-mm. It's the first of three meals we have, including lunch and dinner. When it comes to how much we eat, it really depends on the calorie necessities of each person. One great thing is that we don't really have to cook or do the dishes, since the meals are already cooked on Earth and come in disposable packages. You should know space food has improved greatly in taste and variety since Apollo missions, in which astronauts ate purely freeze-dried food for days. The space work. After we're done eating, it's time to get to work. Each of us settled down to the assigned tasks of the day. These assignments range from supervising experiments to performing routine maintenance on station equipment. Our work also includes checking projects that are controlled from the ground, as well as participating in experiments ourselves to figure out how well our bodies adapt to living in space for long periods of time. Space Gym Now, doing exercise is an essential part of our day. We actually commit hours every day to fitness. Normally on Earth, our bodies are constantly active because they're working against gravity to move. But with very limited gravity in space, movement is easier and doesn't require much work or energy. So, astronauts who spent a long period of time in space and didn't continue to train physically would lose a lot of muscle, which would leave them feeling weak once they return home. That's why it's vital for us to stay physically active to prevent bone and muscle loss. It also helps relieve what we call space snuffles that are caused by body fluids accumulating in the head due to not being tugged downward by gravity. Our regular exercise options include cardio using a treadmill or a bike. We do some weightlifting too. And to do all these, we have to strap ourselves down to the exercise machines because if we don't, we'll float away and our efforts would be for nothing. Free time. Mission organizers on Earth make time every day for us to relax and have fun here in space. This is when we write emails, watch movies, or even play an instrument. But to be honest, the most popular pastime in space is looking out the window to watch the Earth go by beneath you. There are also spectacular sunrises and sunsets to enjoy, which occur every 45 minutes as we orbit. So it's fair to say there's no time to get bored. By the way, just like Earthlings, we get weekends off, too, to recharge. Sweet dreams It's important for us to get a good night's sleep to have energy for the next day's tasks. However, here in space, we can't climb into our beds. We have sleeping bags instead, which are attached to the wall to keep us secure. If they weren't, we'd be floating around all night, which sounds neither safe nor restful. Okay, I gotta go, because I gotta go. It's probably one of the worst nightmares for an astronaut to float away to outer space without any hope to return. Just imagine slowly moving away from the International Space Station into an endless black void because of some accident, somewhere where there's absolutely nothing but a cold vacuum. Fortunately, you still have an opportunity to survive. Let's have a detailed look at the moment when this can happen. So, you're on the International Space Station, It's now at an altitude of about 250 miles in the upper layers of the atmosphere. It's important to mention that it's not just hanging out there in space. Earth's gravity is constantly pulling on the station. Not to fall, the station needs to fly around our planet at a speed of about 17,000 miles per hour. That speed is fast enough to help the station fight the planet's pull. But on the ISS, when you go into outer space, you don't feel this speed. It seems to you that you're floating in one place, watching Earth spin. But there's still a lot of space debris that moves in the opposite direction. From the point of view of a person on the ISS, the speed of these objects is incredibly fast. You put on a spacesuit. It has oxygen supplies and is equipped with a water compartment so you can drink during the mission. So, you're about to walk into space. First, you need to go through a special door called an airlock. Once you're inside, you see that there are two doors here. You enter and close the first door to block access to the space station's oxygen. Then you open the door leading to space. What you're about to do is called a spacewalk. 
There are several reasons why you might be in outer space right now. You may be conducting scientific experiments to find out how different things behave in space. Also, you can be testing new equipment, sensors, and other high-tech gizmos. Another reason might be the repair of failed parts or routine maintenance of the International Space Station. Before taking a step into the void, you attach your spacesuit to a rope connected to the body of the ship. You can also fasten small cables to your tools, such as a screwdriver or a wrench, so that you don't lose them. You push off the ship and experience a feeling similar to swimming underwater. By the way, before going out into a zero-gravity area, astronauts train inside a huge swimming pool. You hold on to the parts of the ship and head to the place that needs to be repaired. Let's say you need to tighten a small screw. One astronaut once said that any work in outer space is difficult. You're wearing a huge suit that slows down your movements and makes you clumsy. It also makes your skin itchy. The work can last up to several hours. During this time, you sweat a lot. One of the spacesuit filters may be broken. In this case, all the fluid released by your body can spread all over the suit and reach your face. Your eyes may start watering. Tears will make your vision blurry. As you see, dozens of dangers are lurking out there in open space, and there are no clear instructions on how to deal with most of them. Anyway, you're tightening the screw, but something goes wrong. The wrench jumps out of your hand, and the screw flies out of the hull of the huh. ship. You try to catch it and accidentally push off the station. You manage to grab the screw, but your body is already flying away. You have nothing to hold on to, but you have the rope. And oh no, it's not tied to your spacesuit anymore. You've attached it incorrectly. Now you're not just flying away from the station. Your body is also spinning. The views of blue earth and black space switch in front of your eyes. You can't stop. Fortunately, the cable is not the only safety measure. Your spacesuit is equipped with a safer. Simplified aid for EVA rescue. This is a backpack with fuel that works like a jetpack. You activate the backpack and it levels your flight. You stop spinning and calm down a bit. Now, you know exactly where the ISS is located. Next, you have to choose the direction manually and fly up to the station very carefully. The safer releases gas from small tubes, and this makes you fly forward. Using the safer control panel that looks similar to a joystick, you can change the direction in which the gas is released. This way, you'll steer your spacesuit. Make sure the station is in your line of sight. Press the joystick to activate the tubes, but take your time. You have to stabilize your forward movement. Pressing the wrong button can cause you to spin again, and this will reduce your chances of returning. Each astronaut spends many hours in a virtual reality simulator that makes them feel like being in outer space. So know how to control the safer. You're approaching the station at a slow pace. Don't let the backpack speed you up. If you start to accelerate, you need to point the tubes in the opposite direction to slow yourself down. If you fly too fast, you can crash into the station and damage the spacesuit. You've finally arrived at the ISS. You need to cling to something and move toward the airlock. You feel as if you're climbing a mountain underwater. You get to the airlock. Phew! But let's go back in time to the moment when you were flying away from the ISS. So, you tried to use the backpack to level your movement. You're nervous and can't calm down. You randomly press the joystick and chaotically direct the tubes in different directions. A few minutes pass. You haven't come closer to the station and the fuel in the safer has run out. Now, you're even more nervous. Let's go back in time again. You float away from the ISS, then use the safer and slow down the rotation speed of your body. Now you're facing the ISS. You approach the station with slow but steady thrusts. Everything is going well, but at one moment, you notice some movement. This is a small piece of metal from an old satellite. It crashes into the safer and slices through the backpack. Fuel starts leaking out into space. You start spinning again because of the impact. You don't understand which way you are moving. All you need now is to take a deep breath and use the remaining fuel to stop. Done. You're floating without rotating. There are no instructions and protocols that will help you get out of this situation. You're moving in outer space and can control this process. To return to the ISS, you need to push off something. Fortunately, you have time to think about what to do next. Your spacesuit has oxygen reserves that are enough for several hours. Also, you have water. You can drink it through a small rubber straw attached to the inside of your helmet neck ring. You're the first human in history who got into such a situation. But this doesn't mean there's no chance of survival. If you can throw something to the side, it set you in motion.
For example, if you had a heavy wrench, you could throw it in the opposite direction from the ISS. This way, you'd launch yourself toward the station. But unfortunately, you have nothing to throw. You have your broken safer, but you can't remove it without another person's assistance. You enjoy the beautiful view of Earth and try to breathe as slowly as possible to save oxygen. It seems there's no chance left for you. But at this moment, other astronauts call you using the radio. They see your location and are going to save you. Your colleague is heading in your direction. She's attached securely to two long cables. She's going to give you one of them when she reaches you. Using the safer, the astronaut flies in your direction. She's very close. Finally, she slows down and grabs your hand. She unhooks one of the cables from her spacesuit and attaches it to yours. Using the cable, you approach the station. At this moment, a rusty bolt flies by. The main danger is that space debris can break through your spacesuit and tear the rope. You accelerate and reach the airlock. And then, you open the door and dive inside. One of the most dangerous space missions has been completed. Theoretically, there's another way to save you. A spacecraft delivering food and air supplies to the ISS can pick you up and bring you back to the station. But this mission is even more difficult, as it requires a very precise route calculation. If something goes wrong, the spaceship can kick you. In this case, you will fly away at high speed. You can travel for several hours until you run out of oxygen, or a piece of space debris destroys your spacesuit. Fortunately, all astronauts are well-trained and experienced enough to avoid such accidents. Hey Mythbusters, today we're debunking some classic space myths. Hop on the next space shuttle and let's get to the bottom of these tales once and for all. Picture this, you're floating weightlessly in space, sipping on a cup of delicious hot chocolate, when a peculiar thought pops into your head. Can you scream in outer space? And if yes, would anyone hear that scream? If you've watched the movie Alien, then you know the answer to this one. You can't hear sounds in outer space. It's not that sounds don't exist. It's just that you can't hear them. There's no one better to clarify this myth than Chris Hadfield. He's been on a couple of spacewalks during his life as an astronaut. And once you're out there in the darkness of space, you can't hear anything. All you hear is silence. Complete silence. But hey, just around the corner is a massive ball of explosion, aka the sun. We just can't hear the explosions happening because there's no medium for sound to travel through. It would be quite uncomfortable for an astronaut, though, if they could hear all the noises going on in outer space. Now, imagine you're zipping through space, feeling like a futuristic superhero, when a shooting star passes by your side. But wait, is it really a star? Unfortunately, shooting stars are not stars at all. They are small space rocks known as meteoroids, entering Earth's atmosphere and creating a stunning light show. Oh, and since we're debunking myths, let's head straight for another one. You've probably heard that meteors only crash into Earth on extremely rare occasions. Like once every dinosaur extinguishing apocalypse. That's not true. Scientists estimate that about 48 tons of meteoritic material fall on Earth each day. But almost all of this material is vaporized in Earth's atmosphere. The bright trail we see in the night sky is what we popularly call a shooting star. Next time you make a wish upon a shooting star, remember, you're actually hoping on a tiny piece of space debris. It's not so romantic after all. Can we or can we not fly into the stratosphere on air balloons? Apparently, we can. The Earth's stratosphere starts relatively close to the ground, about 7 or 8 miles up from the Earth's surface but it continues a long way up. If you were to fly yourself all the way into the stratosphere with some type of air balloon, just make sure you have really good equipment at hand. You'll need a special suit and some breathing devices because air starts to get pretty thin the higher you get. Of course, if you do go all the way up, you need to get a picture of the Earth's curvature. So take a chest harness with you where you can put a special camera or something like that. And how about you live stream the whole thing? That would be a first! Imagine it's been 102 days since you left Earth. You've adapted well to life in outer space, 
But something weird is happening to your body. You're getting taller. How is that even possible? Don't stress about it. It's completely normal. The truth of the matter is, you're not getting taller. This is what happens to your body when it's not under the effect of gravity. Our body has natural space between vertebrae and joints. On Earth, this space is almost completely squeezed due to the force of gravity. But in space, your body gets some time off of the pushing force of gravity and begins to stretch more and more. So yes, astronauts can grow up to 3% taller when they're on long missions. And here's a curiosity. NASA has that all covered when they're tailor-making spacesuits, of course. This way, astronauts will always have extra space in their suits. Once astronauts are back on Earth, the anti-gravity effect will wear off. So maybe they'll spend a few days wearing capri pants before it fits perfectly on their bodies again. Never have I ever pictured an airplane door bursting open mid-flight and a bunch of passengers being sucked into the atmosphere like flying feathers. Well, I'm betting most of you have had similar thoughts when getting inside a plane. Now imagine if this were to happen in outer space. Common knowledge says that if an astronaut is sucked out of an airlock, this person would be burnt to a crisp. Brace yourselves, because this is not only true, but the reality of it is way worse. According to astronaut Chris Hadfield, this is what would happen. The part of your body in the shade of the sun would experience temperatures of negative 418 degrees Fahrenheit, while the part of you getting sunlight would burn at around 480 degrees Fahrenheit. Your lungs would collapse, and your blood would start to boil like tea water. So, you would burn, freeze, lose your ability to breathe, and boil. Yikes! How many times have you heard that astronauts have to work out every second of every day, otherwise they'll pass out? This is a complete myth. Remember we talked about gravity earlier? Due to the lack of gravity in outer space, our bodies don't have to do any heavy work. Our torsos don't have to sustain the weight of our heads and we don't have to make any effort to move our legs because, essentially, there's no walking in outer space. Now, imagine living like that for six months or even a year of your life. Your muscles could turn into jello. That's why astronauts work out. They'll strap themselves and run on a treadmill, or they'll do some weightlifting in a special machine. This way, their muscles won't feel the lack of gravity too much they do need to keep hydrated, though. You know what? If I was an astronaut, I'd ask NASA if I could take my super soft water flask up into space with me. You've probably heard that space smells like burnt steak or barbecue sauce. Now, as much as this sounds absurd, this myth is more true than it is false. Astronauts obviously can't smell space when they're in it because they can't take off their helmets. They usually smell it once a space vehicle docks and they open up a hatch. Apparently, what causes this smell is the presence of hydrocarbons that float around in space. Who would have thought, huh? Hey, smart people, let me ask you a question. Do you really think that if astronauts fly at the speed of light, they won't age a single second? I knew you'd say no. Let's get a few things straight. First of all, we haven't figured out how to operate vehicles at the speed of light. This would require an immense amount of energy, and we don't have the technology to do that. Second, even if we managed to send a human inside a spacecraft that traveled at the speed of light, this person would still age. They would age differently than the people who remained on Earth, that's a fact, but they would still age. Do you lot really think there's such a thing as immortality? Nah. If you've seen the first Avatar, then you certainly remember that humans only managed to get to Pandora because they traveled in cryosleep. In other words, they froze their bodies, put them in a cryobed, and traveled for years without aging. Yes, this sounds amazing, but we still don't have the technology to do that. Our bodies are mainly made out of water, right? And when you freeze water, it expands. That's why you should never leave soda cans unattended in your freezer. Right now, if we froze a person's body, the water inside of it would expand, harming tissues and organs. So no, we can't cryosleep our way into interstellar travel. Not yet, at least. Here's a crazy thought. What would happen if an astronaut took a drone with him on one of their spacewalks? 
Unless it's a NASA-designed drone, maybe the thing would freeze and burn like humans would if they went into space without a suit. But hey, a person can dream, can't they? That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.